Whatever you want. All right, welcome everyone to the September 2nd, 2014 Chicago City Council meeting. I call the, the workshop this evening to order. Mr. McNeil, could you please call the roll? We note the roll as all five present. Thank you, sir. All stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, item number three, approval of the agenda. Do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda this evening? Council? Mark? Nothing. All right, entertain a motion to approve. Council Whiting. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I'll Council Mokul. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Item four, consent business. Anything to remove or add a consent? Councilor Lehman. 4D. 4D to remove from consent. Anything else? Entertain a motion for consent agenda as amended. Councilor Lehman. Pass the consent agenda as amended. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Luce. Mr. McNeil, McNeil, could you please call the consent business, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 4 adopts resolution number 7476, accepting the donation of light fixtures from Valley Fair for the Southbridge Community Park Hockey Rink. 4B approves the awarding of a contract to R.W. O'Brien Contracting LLC for the construction of the Hubert Park Open Air Shelter be paid for the SMSC Intergovernmental Grant. 4C approves a change order in the amount of $21,805 for general project changes and a change order for $29,058.05 to realign the northerly bituminous trail in the Southbridge Community Park construction project. 4D was removed from consent agenda. 4E approves the appointment of Councilor Michael Luce as the City Council representative and Community Development Director Michael Leak is alternate to the MVTA Board of Directors. 4F approves resolution number 7478, receiving a report and calling for a public hearing on the Hilldale Drive Improvements Project number 2014-3. 4G approves an amendment to the Scott Joint Prosecution Association Joint Powers Agreement, providing for the ability to contract with Scott County for prosecution services and merging employees. 4H accepts with regret the resignation of Todd Hallett from the Planning Commission BOAA, effective July 11, 2014. 4I, approve staff to submit a grant application to the State Health Improvement uh, Program in the amount of $15,000. And 4J, approves payments of bills and electronic transfers in the amount of $959,549.57. All right, any discussion on those items? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. We move on to item number five, recognition of involved citizens by City Council. Anyone here who has uh, something that they talk about that is not on the agenda this evening? All right, we're gonna move on to six. Uh, business removed from consent, agenda discussed at this time. Item 4D, Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I took it off because uh, yesterday being a holiday, I couldn't call and ask my questions. The uh, Park CIP 1.8 million for this project is anticipated to be funded when Quarry Lake, 1.8 million. I don't understand your question. Anticipated to be funded when? Yes. Um, currently, we have the, Mr. Councilor Lehman, um, members of the council. Currently, we have the park project planned for 2015. However, we are, we don't have the full amount for the park. If we complete all the projects that we have planned in 2014, uh, we do not have the full amount for the project to be all be constructed in 2015. So part of the concept planning would be a phased approach of construction so we could build what we need with the funds we have or at that point council would be able to come back and look at the funding for the park reserve CIP and determine if additional funding from other sources is put in there if we hold off on the project this right now is for design services to actually plan the park right now we have a very basic concept plan so we won't know what the actual cost of the park will be until we get it designed questions well if we don't know how we're going to fund it unless we're going to have a discussion about alternative funding methods we should probably have that discussion to see if we're all in agreement of how we're going to fund it well I think we'll have that discussion in the future for now we're just talking about the planning phase of it and getting it 
planned and then we have to take the plan and decide if the plan is what we want and go through that process the same way we do all the other parks. What's the balance on the park CIP? Do you know? I can look that up and get that to you by the end of the meeting. Um, okay. I don't know off the top of my head, no. All right. Do you have it? Give well, me our finance director. Right Julie to the rescue <laughs> as always. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, just ran this hot off the press. The park, uh, now are you looking at the park CIP, the park yes. reserve? Yes. Roughly $2 million. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank Anybody you. have a motion? Council Whiting. Move to authorize uh, the appropriate staff to enter into agreement with uh, WSB and Associates Incorporated for the preparation of the final design and specifications and bidding documents as well as services including the bidding procedures and construction administration for the development of Quarry Lake Park in the amount not to exceed $212,700. Do we have a second? A second. Second question from Mokul. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item uh, 7A, presentation regarding the Chamber of Public Policies Committee's sign regulations. If uh, we got a lot of folks, anybody, do we want to have discussion, discussion about this? Just want to present, or what would you like to do? I thought we could present, and I'm, I'm open to the okay. discussion, questions. All right, perfect. All right. New format. All right. Thank you, Mary Ta Mayor Tabke, members of the council. So on September 4th, 2012, after holding three public forums with Shakopee business leaders, as well as several city leaders and staff, the Shakopee Chamber and its public policy committee presented to the City of Shakopee's Economic Development Advisory Council Commission a list of concerns as well as possible solutions for the sign ordinance as it was then written. Our goal today is still the same as they were when we first addressed the council two years ago. That is to simplify and modify the existing sign ordinance. At that time, we suggested developing a graphic presentation such as a table with basic requirements and regulations, as well as suggesting that it be written for the audience that it's intended, and that is the business community. I believe that this goal meets the chamber's goal, the city's, as well as Scott County's goal of providing exemplary customer service to the business owners who already have or who may want to invest in our community in the future. This has been a long and arduous and sometimes frustrating process, but we feel that significant progress has been made in several of the 17 initial points we presented back in 2012, and that is thanks in large part to the hard work of city staff. And although it is not done yet, I believe we're close to having a signed ordinance that meets the city's goals as well as the needs of the business community. So tonight I am here on behalf of the Chamber Board and our Public Policy Committee to propose to you a framework for the ordinance that we believe will bring this document to the user-friendly model that we would all like and accomplish our shared goal of finally putting this project to bed. So our primary goal is now as it was then and that is to simplify the ordinance. One of our original concerns with the ordinance was that it was difficult to navigate both online and in print. We would like to take it from its current draft status to an even more simple, easy to navigate state with simplified language, with the use of a concise table, and without the use of cross references. So we've prepared a table that will allow businesses to easily view the portion of the ordinance that per pertains to them for all types of signage versus the current state of a business owner needing to search the entire ordinance to figure out what they can and cannot do. Now, the table you have in front of you, okay, I don't know how to do this, but there we go. Wow. Okay. It's small. I apologize for that. So we have left the numbers out of this document on purpose. We are not sign experts, and we believe that city staff would be best equipped to fill those in. What we want you to take a look at tonight is simply the framework and the format. If you look across the top, it addresses the different areas as well as down here, the different signs and what would be allowed and what would not be allowed. Now, although we feel that city staff would be best equipped to fill in these numbers, we would like some input on specific areas that we feel are not currently meeting the needs of the business community. But that is not the purpose of tonight's presentation. 
We have also not filled in um, the areas of the current sign ordinance that don't pertain to the business community. So if you look to the far right, you see residential, and then we just have other columns that um, we have left out that uh, we believe city staff would be best equipped to fill in. But the point we're making is that this table is easy, easily adaptable to cover all of the, the different zones in the city that require sign ordinance. So as far as the text portion of the ordinance <coughs> that will support the proposed table, we've also provided you with a copy of the City of Arden Hills Ordinance, which we believe is a good example of, a, of an easy to read, easy to navigate, and easy to modify as required document. Now, in order to make this table even more user friendly, we also would like to suggest, okay, zooming out here. Mark, there we go, sorry. We would also like to suggest the use of an overlay to the existing zone map that would identify business districts by common use, easy to understand titles versus zoning language that the average layperson or business person would not easily identify with. And we have, this is our draft of what we think that would look like. Now I think it's really important to point out that this is currently the zoning map, the city zoning map. Our proposed overlay, if you just focus on these titles, doesn't change zoning at all. Rather, we have simply grouped and labeled the zones in this manner to make it easier for the businesses to locate which zone they belong to, but it also addresses cer certain uh, specific geographic needs. For example, if you take a look at the current labeling, you'll notice that the businesses along 169, as well as the businesses along 101, are both labeled and zoned highway business. Well, those two areas are visually and economically different and have different needs and opportunities for signage. Our overlay map and the table framework utilizing the new district titles addresses that without affecting zoning or needing to change the zoning. It quite simply just makes it easy to understand for the person who's going to utilize it. And then our third goal for this evening is to propose that we work out the details of the ordinance after this framework has been agreed upon. The chamber, we're not made up of sign experts. We're volunteer business people. We're customer service experts. We're business advocacy experts. This is not our wheelhouse, we understand that. But tonight our goal is to prevent a, a framework that we believe can accompl accomplish our common goal of having a document that addresses the needs of our customers and yours and meets the requirements of the city at the same time. So tonight we are here to ask the council to direct staff to one, use the table that we have provided as a reliable guide or a template for the new ordinance. Two, propose recommendations for the, member, the measurements to be included in that document. And three, to write supporting ordinances or modify the existing one to match the table in both tone and simplicity. Our overarching goal in taking on this project two years ago was to strike a balance between the amount and type of signage that a city is willing to allow and the amount and type of signage that meets the needs of the business community and its consumers. And I'm confident that this framework, paired with city staff's subject matter expertise, can accomplish that in a very short time frame. I thank you for your time and consideration, and I welcome any questions. Councilor Lehman. Thank you, Angie. Yeah. What's a graphic sign? A graphic sign is like a picture. Yeah. Like the Dr. Downs. It's not, yeah. Like, for a good example would be. Um, an electronic sign, is it? No, it's not. So the back of the, um, the bait shop building, how it has that seven up painted on it, that would be a graphic sign. So I believe it's up. Type thing. Yeah, only more of a advertisement type than a art piece. Other questions? Councilor Whiting. Has the chamber in the public policy group thought about the outdoor advertising aspect of the signed ordinances or anything like that? Any Help me understand your have you, uh, billboards. Question. Have you thought have you thought about how that plays into some of the sign ordinance? You know what, as I said, Councillor Whiting, we are not the sign experts. We are simply here tonight to present a framework that, that and, and if the city has a strong opinion on billboards, I would assume that that would fit very nicely in our table. Um, 
that's not for us to proclaim to be experts on. I blame just a couple of thoughts. Um, not completely against what you're what you're asking, but do we add confusion by changing what somebody say somebody has a business out on 83 and 16, and they know they're they're zoned this, and now to look up what's what you're recommending for signage in their neighborhood, they're going to be called something different. Does that level does that add a level of confusion? I really don't think so. Our goal is to actually do the opposite and simplify it. It's not going to change the type of sign or the size of sign or the lighting or anything. It's simply going to make it easier for them to utilize the ordinance once it's written to figure out if they want to make a change or um, add a new sign or if a new business comes in to that same property and is going to need to change the sign. And it's just going to make it easier to figure out what they can and cannot do. Well, Mayor, I guess it's no secret that I'm not a fan of our current sign ordinance. Um, although the first draft that I saw from the chamber, I met with one of the chamber members, and it really didn't touch on one of the concerns I have about um, the sizing. So if you have a small little business like I do, if I put up the, the size of sign that I'm currently allowed, it would look extremely stupid. It would be like half the size of the building. Um, so somehow I'm trying to figure out how we get to something that's sized to the size of the structure, and I think they kind of hit on that in some of this information here. Um, but I think really if we're going to look at the sign ordinance, we should probably figure out what kind of changes we want and direct that towards staff too at the same time. Um, a good, uh, you know, one thing I talked to Michael Leak about concerning signs is these big box that come into town and they want their sign package that they use all over the, the country, you know, um, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have them show us their sign package from other areas of the country and say that's what you get so that they're there. We're forcing them to be consistent with their own model, um, which isn't always the case. We see a lot of different big boxes with different type of packages. And it's almost like how much can we get from whoever, which I guess is open under a P PUD or, or a um, separate permitting process, I suppose. Um, you know, I'm not against billboards on 169. I don't think you can see them businesses traveling down 169. Uh, I think that some of them businesses are in a, in, in a disadvantage. A lot of people don't even know they're there. That's unfortunate. Um, and I don't think we do a very good job of our destinations from 169, whether it's Canterbury or, or Mystic Lake or these types of things. Granted, I don't want to see it like going out to going west where every three blocks you see wall drug, <laughs> a couple more miles, you know. But I think we could make improvements there, I really do, you know. And uh, so I, I think we as a body have to figure out what exactly we want to change in our signed ordinance and pass the whole package over to the staff with their expertise to, to, to do that. I think we've had quite a few, I, I completely agree with you, um, and I think we've had quite a few discussions about this <laughs> over the last two <laughs> years, um, and I think we have a good idea as to what everybody wants to get to. We just need to get it, like you said, down into a list of these are the things. One of my big questions on this, Angie, is how do we, a lot like Matt was talking about, how do we handle, with something as simplified and as clear cut as a table would be how do we handle nuance um, because if you've got like we had to do a variance for shutterfly to make the, mm -hmm. the signage fit with the building like Matt was talking about mm -hmm. um, how do we with something as very clear cut with this and as drastically different um, as some buildings could be within a category mm -hmm. what have you guys talked about with how how that is handled Thank you for asking, Mayor Tarkey. We do have some thoughts on the current variance issue and the variance process. We believe that if you write, there are nuances, and we, and we are such a diverse community geographically and historical downtown versus the new big box, and everybody's got different needs and wants, and it's hard to take a black and white ordinance, which by virtue of what an ordinance does should be black and white, right? But then if you write it that way, how do you allow for that? You can't have everything being a variance. So 
you know, one of the things we have talked about, and again, this goes to council and, and city staff as to whether or not it would work here, is to rethink the current variance process and, and provide for the consideration of a better idea. Now, it's my understanding that when a variance comes forth, it goes to the Planning Commission to the Appeals Board, correct? So they would still hold that power to make that decision. Um, we had an idea that there would be two criteria for allowing such change without having to go through the variance process. As it's written right now, the variance requires a business to prove some sort of hardship and that's its practical difficulty with their signage is how it's written. That's very hard to quantify with a sign, but the bottom line is you can't have business without commercialism. And signs are key to advertising. And if, if they didn't work, businesses wouldn't fight so hard to have them. So our suggestion would be to consider two criteria for allowing a change. So we're not taking away all of the regulation and giving businesses free reign. But so for example, the, if the sign adjustment will not significantly increase or lead to sign clutter in the area or result in a sign that is inconsistent with the purpose of the zoning district in which the property is located, or the sign adjustment will allow that will allow a sign that relates in size, shape, color, illumination, and character to the building and or property. So you can write those however it, it makes sense to allow for the nuances and to allow for a better idea. It's hard to put everything in black and white. You have to allow for creati creativity and advertising and signage, and you can't possibly predict what that's going to be, so you couldn't possibly write every potential scenario into an ordinance. And to have an ordinance that every creative idea requires a variance seems like a pointless ordinance if everything's gonna be a variance. You have a question, Mike? Okay. Um, all right, so my next question with it then is, so with what we've got for a current revision on the ordinance, where mm -hmm. we're at mm -hmm. today, not what's adopted, but where we're at today, um, with the revisions and everything, is it possible to take what we've got and to, I don't know if shoehorn is the right way to say it, but to to get this type of table out of what we've currently got so we I don't need to rewrite the entire, because I think the, the ordinance as it is now gets at a lot of these things that need sure to, there's some tweaks that we need to talk about like Matt said. Um, but is it possible in your guys' opinion to get to something like this from our current ordinance and just have a very clear way of saying what's in there? I think that all of the data required to populate this table is in the ordinance right now. The problem we have is, and, and problem might be strong, the challenge right now is that that's still hard to navigate. It's still hard to find. There's a lot of cross-references to other ordinances. It's very confusing. And that's from somebody who's looked at it for two years. Mm -hmm. So I think the data exists now to populate this table. I think the text exists now, needs to be modified in some areas to support the table. And there are some key points on here that once populated, we would want to go back and revisit, not the point of tonight, but there are some numbers and some ratios that we would want to at least have a follow-up discussion on. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, it exists now, it just needs to be populated. Okay, well that makes it a lot easier. Uh, a little bit of follow up to that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? You, and I'm a, I, I like the over, I like a lot of things. About the table I like, the overlay mm -hmm. map I like. Now, do you think the overlay portion will address some of those issues in the ordinance that we currently have that makes you jump around and look at different parts of that? I think the overlay map in conjunction with the table will address that. The map itself won't if it's still written in the same format that it's written now, where it's, it's text heavy versus simple table. No, I like the idea that it is uh, easy to understand um, um, and the overlay makes sense to me to, to kind of rather than jumping around from zoning to zoning. Mm -hmm. um, if we can, and there may be exceptions, I'd have to think about that. I like the idea of the, the directional destination size, but and, and you kind of touched on the scale portion of it. You know, how do we, you know, make it proportionate to the building? I think maybe that needs to be drawn out a little bit. Um, well, and if you look at the table, there is a spot for that, you okay. know? So if you look at whatever zone, whether it's a wall sign, maximum area, maximum height, all of those things are addressed in here. They just need to be populated with whatever numbers city staff feels is appropriate and safe and meets regulations. 
All right, any further questions? Mayor, could it, could it be as easy as a percentage of the sign front? I mean, let's say you have a building that's this big and you're allowed this percentage of that space. Mm -hmm. Some might have a tall or narrow sign and some might have a rectangle sign. And maybe the business has got a triangle sign or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if it's a percentage of the total wall space, then whoever owns their business wall space knows what they have to use. Mm -hmm. And I haven't looked at it in a while, but I believe that's what's in the current revision that mm -hmm. Mr. Leak had worked on. Is that There is a ratio the, still uh, in there. Yeah. Our, um, I hate to be a complainer. Our concern about that is it's, it's a ratio, um, it's a capped ratio based on the linear footage of the front of your building. And for a business owner to achieve the maximum sign, sign square footage allowed, they would need to have a hundred foot long storefronts. If you think about our community, there are very few businesses that have that long of a storefront. I mean, we're talking anywhere from 20 to 40 feet wide, typically. So we are proposing um, that, mo you know, we take the cap off and instead of having a um, maximum, we have a guaranteed minimum. What if that minimum isn't proportional to the building? It could be written in, I would think that, and again, I'm not a sign expert, but I would think it could be written in a way that would be, and keep in mind, businesses, just because they're allowed square footage, doesn't mean they're going to, I mean, you said yourself, you could fill up half of the front of your building, but it would look stupid. So businesses are gonna do what is aesthetically pleasing and what they can afford. Signs are not cheap. All right, so I think everybody, is do you want to no i think everyone is on board with the concept at least of table like it's put forward is that correct council loose i have one question as to a temporary signage you know for an event or something like mm -hmm. that um how is that being addressed or again we would leave that up to city staff i you know okay. we um we love signs right we want our businesses to be able to be seen by anybody driving into town I heard the mayors of, of our city and Prior Lake on the radio saying 10 million people a summer. That's awesome. We want them to see other businesses besides Valley Fair, Mystic, the Renaissance, and Canterbury. And nobody loves those guys more than I do, but if there's a business downtown, a more crew, or you know one sexy biker chick, and they can't see their signs driving by, they're not gonna pull off the road and spend money here. And so you know, if they're having a sale and they get to put a sign out, awesome. But I would expect that 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 your staff would be able to put the right regulations in place that makes sense. Yeah, I just think we need need a temporary sign, you know, if they're for a special event or something sure. where they you know, can go a little larger mm -hmm. or a lot larger. And right now that's in the ordinance. And so once it gets populated in this table, then we, we would propose that that would be kind of the final phase of this is just reviewing that and making sure council and staff and, and the business community is on board and, and can, we can all agree on it because I know none of us want to do this again next year. Councilor Layman. Mayor, can we hear from uh, staff pertaining to their thoughts on this type of idea? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, don't go far, probably. I won't, I'll be right here. Mr. Leak. Council, are there specific questions you have for me? Well, I, maybe I can ask your past experiences of if, if there's a increased maximum and it's not proportional to the business, to the building, um, I know as well as you do in the past that we've had businesses that came in and wanted more than what was allowed. Mm -hmm. um, what does that create for us or potentially create for us? Um, over the years, generally what that has resulted in, if it occurs often enough, is an amendment in the signed regulations to allow something different than the code previously had allowed. So for example, when Cub first came to the community, they wanted a larger sign. They got a variance for that. We subsequently amended the sign code to allow the same amount of signage on a building, but for the property owner or operator, to decide where the signage was gonna go. So if they wanted to focus on a building front that they thought was key for them, they were able to do that as a result of CUB and the 
target Cole's development that those changes were made. Um, so generally that's what happens if it becomes a significant enough issue. However, we've had issues where the council has previously directed that we make changes to the sign code, most notably with respect to the two furniture uses on 12th Avenue. And when we brought an amendment to the council in place at that time, they chose not to approve that amendment. So it's a little bit hit or miss, but I will tell you that generally speaking, when sign variances have come to the city council, um, generally it's on appeal, they've been approved. I think the ratio during a 10 year period was about 11 of 12 or 13 that were approved by the city council. Um, I guess, I would ask a couple of questions um, because it's not clear to me how we get to what the ask is of you. The ask is for everyone to approve this format. The questions are, first of all, who's everyone? Secondly, as Ms. Whitcomb indicated, there are a number of things that are not filled in on this. And you know that we spent a year with the EDAC, which contained a number of members of the Public Policy Committee at the Chamber and the Planning Commission addressing each and every points in their additional initial request. So who do we involve in getting an agreement on what this format um, looks like and if it's the appropriate format and how we go about filling it in? Just a couple of key points. Mm -hmm. On the map, and I understand that you um, find some appeal in the overlay concepts, but this map leaves open the question of really where are the boundaries for the overlays that are indicated here? And how do we get to an agreement on what those boundaries are uh, without excluding some potential businesses? 101 is particularly difficult because we do have retail businesses along 101 outside the areas that are indicated here that are not major recreation businesses. So that's what in question, and how do we get to that definition? Who do we involve in that definition? If you look at the table, and I do want to note, because I know you've seen it, that the draft that we provided to the chamber uh, roughly a year ago after those meetings with the EDAC and Planning Commission did have two table formats in it. So the notion of using a table is not brand new. We responded to that in the first draft. Uh, but please note here, this still says maximum square footage and my understanding of the concept that's been presented to you is that the public policy committee is not really looking for maximums. They are looking for a minimum sign size that is allowed. Councillor Lehman asked the question about what about a small business. So the question is if you have a minimum, are you allowing them? Do you draft an ordinance that says they can have smaller than the minimum sign so that they're not stuck with the minimum sign? but this table still talks in terms of maximums. They've talked about a process um, for letting larger signs, presumably, and taller signs be constructed. That is not a variance process. There was actually one of those that was recommended by the Public Policy Committee in the draft. Clearly, that's not sufficient, um, and we would have to consult with the attorney to, to see what the approach is, but my understanding of what I'm hearing is that they are looking for, look, we want a minimum size and height, and we'd really like them to be able to do what they economically think makes a lot of sense and that they can afford, which really means if that's the case, there's no need for an additional process. All that is is record keeping saying that someone came in for a sign permit for a 75 foot tall sign that happens to be 600 square feet. Because you're not really contemplating, even with the criteria as they were outlined in their very general criteria, um, whether or not you would end up denying because you don't have the kind of criteria that a variance process presents. And they are very subjective measures. How do you determine whether it contributes to clutter in that particular area, especially if taking Councillor Lehman's tack on the 169 corridor, you might want to consider billboards in addition to signages for the buildings. So bottom line, the question I have is, how is it and who do you want to involve in getting consensus on this approach? And by what means do we get consensus on filling in the blanks that are not filled in here? 
And for those areas that are not addressed here because they really are focusing on commercial retail, do you want us to go to the other provisions that we put together in this last process? Do you want us to look at something new? You may not be aware of it, but I actually did cut six pages out of the existing sign regulations in that draft. I spent months and months trying to reorganize it so it was a little more intelligible. But, you know, do you want us to go to something different for those areas that aren't addressed here? Um, and that's not addressed by this proposal. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and uh, Council, certainly I think one of the first things we do is we would, in fact, populate what the Chamber has brought forth tonight, and I think with that, then can identify you know, where are the blanks that still need to be filled in and work with the uh, Chamber. I think uh, Ms. Whitcomb referred to uh, the fact that there were some things that weren't fully addressed there. Let's find out what those are, uh, explore those, see if we can do something, whether it's formatting uh, through the Arden Hills example that they propose here, to see if we can come up with that, work with the Public Policy Committee with the EDAC and Planning Commission and uh, look for those things. If it means that we've got a change in what we have for variance, I understand the problem with trying to point to, uh, other than economic hardship, uh, what the hardship would be on that. That may be a challenge, but I think we're, there's some opportunities out there. With that then, and once the Public Policy Committee is comfortable with that, we could bring it back to you and have further discussion. Uh, Angie, did you did you have any thoughts on next steps? Uh, well, I would agree with Mr. McNeil. I think I think we all share the common goal. We all want a sign ordinance that meets the needs of the city and the business community. We want it to be easy to read, and and meet regulations for safety, for aesthetics, for all of that. Um, our goal tonight was just to simply present this framework to address the concern of the overlay map. We went zone by zone, and there is a direct correlation between the, the districts and the zones that currently exist. We left none out, so they are all addressed. So that would be very easily um, outlined with a Sharpie, and we can do that for you. Um, you know, our goal is to present this framework. We, we are not on the opposite side of the table from the city. We want the same thing. Um, we are not sign ordinance experts. We are business people and customer service experts, and our goal is to provide a document that serves all of us. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right, Councilor Luce. The overlay map, I, I like the, the look of it, but I think we need to nail down the boundaries somehow so that people know, you know, that this road is the division between the two boundaries or this, uh, geographical location somehow has to be determined. And that's <coughs> gonna be a major part of this as looking at this map, we have a lot of different areas. Yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking, um, which we all know takes a long time sometimes. Um, all right, so from here, if we could, um, we need to, as council, uh, give some sort of direction as to what we want to do. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I'm going to make a motion to uh, direct our staff to try to fill in this as best possible, um, just so we can see what it actually does for us, um, and then bring it back, and we'll have a con continue the discussion on how we're going to deal with ratio of size to structures and things like that without just leaving it open. But the motion basically is to have staff put all the information that we currently have in our ordinance onto this document and let's see where it gets us. And bring it back. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second that. I I'd like to amend that so that we also have the boundaries decided as in that process. Because I think just coming and filling out a graph right. or it isn't going to give us the boundaries right. to make us better judge of okay that will work for that area. Okay, I accept the amendment. So, but with that, does the as discussion, does the second oh, accept that? Yeah. Does the second accept that? Sorry, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, with that, so what happens with um, so like are we going to 
do you want to use the current ordinance or Mr. Leak worked a long time on a revised ordinance that I, f I don't know if it made it all the way to council or not. I'm not 100% sure. But there's a revised ordinance that we met a lot of goals. We had it in our packet on okay. our Friday packet. Okay. Um, do you want it to use the revised ordinance, which I would suggest? Well, if it's not too much work, I think we're going to end up revising it, so to me it doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of seeing which numbers are in it. If you want to use revised, that's fine. There's been quite a bit of work yeah. put into that yep. already. So and, and I think, I, at least I know I'm going to have a revision to it. Um, along with that, and I didn't see it in the packet. Did that have the... Oh, no, uh, not this packet. It was sent on the September mail matters. Oh, got it. Um, with that, okay. uh, did it have um, the tables in there at all? It did not, but it did have the map. Before oh. we go, I will take it back to the. Mm -hmm. It was a day table. It was not the table one presented yeah. tonight. Yeah, day table. I see it. So what we've got, the Mr. Lee could put together is a table that looks like this. Yep. Why doesn't it look like this? Uh, that was in there too. I think it all. Further. They're all in there. Um. I guess part of my issue is I'm having a hard time pinpointing the difference between where we're at right now and what public policy committee would like to see. Mr. Lee? Mayor, members of the council, maybe I can speak to that and suggest a course of action with respect to it. The draft that you have in front of it had a key element that related to a process that would allow for different sign heights um, and doesn't do the same thing that the chamber public policy committee is talking to you about now which is to establish areas in the city that have overlays and that was in fact a theme of their first comments um, what I would suggest is that you not attempt to make a decision to use the draft that was worked on previously for that reason because it it does have a different emphasis it is more like the existing code with a couple of tables and a new mechanism or two to allow some flexibility than it is the approach that has been outlined for you tonight. So what I would suggest is if you're going to give us direction to try and fill in some of the gaps that when we bring those back to you, we bring that other draft and perhaps we can do some comparison and you can decide at that time whether or not you want to vary from the current ordinance and have an interim ordinance before you have this approach worked out. Does that make any sense rather than trying to do it tonight? Kind of. Council Lehman? So what he's saying is uh, you'd have to withdraw your amendment. He wants to use the existing code. And what I'm saying is once this information is filled in, it's going to say what your maximums are, but it's probably not going to say anything about proportionate to the size of the structure, which is something I'm going to be looking for. And Councillor Lehman, members of the council, Michael Leake is not saying he wants to use the existing code. Michael Leake is saying that you probably don't want to make an ad hoc judgment to use the draft that was arrived at about a year ago without discussion of that. That's what I'm saying. And the approach that they're proposing is substantially different. When we start to fill it in, frankly, I'm going to suggest, based on what they've said, that we don't want the table to say maximums because effectively they want a process that will allow for larger and higher signs without any real process other than a couple of pretty general and judgmental um, characteristics. I'm not sure as I listen to them that if if a Board of Adjustment or a City Council had to uh, craft findings related to those two things that your City Attorney would like them. That's something we'd have to take a look at. Um, but since it is so different and you are apparently in general agreement with it, I don't see any point in taking the interim step of adopting the ordinance that was previously done. If that was appropriate, I think the Public Policy Committee of the Chamber would have said, let's go ahead with that, but we have something else we want to look at. They didn't. They said, we have something else we want to look at. 
And so. having looked at this for the first time tonight and having not seen it before, I don't. I have not either. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's that far apart. I, I, I think that what we've got in our current current ordinance, not the current ordinance, with your the revised ordinance that you worked on can be made to fit the goals, I believe. We'll uh, certainly find out. And we figure it out. So the best way to do that again is how do we get there? Well, the motion in front of you is to direct staff to try and we're still fill in the yeah. gaps. Sorry, mm -hmm. I forgot. And we're then still bring that back. Um, unless you have some other direction, if you pass that motion, that's what we will do. If we have questions, we will certainly contact the chamber public policy folks and discuss them with them. And and I do understand Councillor Layman's concerns. We've had some conversations about that. Um, and I'm not sure it's addressed in the table, but we may, in looking at it, suggest a couple of approaches in addition to what's here. So that I'm clear, this would be looking at the table, populating that, talking with the Public Policy Committee. There's a question as to the overlay map and how to best utilize that so it's understandable. Um, does it make sense? Does it make sense to address those first and once we get an agreement then look at the format whether it's taking the revised one that's been worked on using the Arden Hills example and then going back and that would be the uh, ordinance then that would govern where this is going. Councilman Layman. You know, the end result that I would like to see is a very easy to understand ordinance that anybody can pick up and know exactly what they're allowed to do and if they follow exactly what they're allowed to do it fits with a percentage of the total wall space in the size and, and you can't really spell that out in sizing alone because if you allow a 50 foot by 20 foot sign in this area in that area of town you have multiple size structures mm -hmm. that size is not a one size fits all size for all those buildings and I'm not gonna leave it on the business or the property to decide that as a policymaker. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, do you guys still? You're yep, I'm good okay. with all that. Um, all right, any further discussion on that motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Anyone opposed? All right, that portion passes unanimously. Um, so should we bring this back for another discussion at the workshop in October and bring if uh, staff has got it ready by then. We'll do our best. Because um, I'd really like to have this put to bed by the end of the year. <laughs> it's It's been going for a while. Um, so let's put, uh, let's get all the information together so everyone can, and if uh, you could meet Mark with uh, Angie and whoever from the Public Policy Committee to see really the differences. Um, to line those out so that we can make some decisions because I don't I don't know if I'm comfortable with the overlays I don't know if I'm right. comfortable with those at this point if it makes a ton of sense to put a lot of time into them um, Because I I love the concept, but whether we can or should get there now or if it makes sense to do it now I don't I don't know. We need to have more discussion about it Mayor, you might just end up using the existing zoning boundaries mm -hmm. and sliding the new name into the existing boundaries yeah, because I don't know how far apart we are between mm -hmm. everything now. Council uh, Whiting? Just the last comment. You know, I do have a, a, a little bit of an issue of pulling off the maximums, and I, I like the idea of a, a portion at the percentage of wall space or percentage of scale. You know, I think that's important to uh, look at. But just letting it go to, you know, maximum height or, or maximum width, that, that I have a problem with. Okay. Angie? Can I just make one more comment? Please do. Mayor, members of the council. I keep hearing conversation about the overlay. We took every zoning district and lumped them in there. So it would be very easy to outline for you that every zone is covered. We basically didn't change anything except make the titles easier to understand to somebody who's not city zoned. So right. we just grouped the existing. We just grouped the existing yeah. and titled them differently. I just want to make sure to, to clarify once again, we're not here tonight to discuss minimums or maximums or numbers. We purposely avoided that because that is not our expertise. We, we defer to city staff on that. Mayor, and I, and 
I think what I'm hearing from staff and deferred to legal department is that you, you've clumped possibly light industrial, heavy industrial, and, and highway business into one area where currently they have separate zoning and separate uh, mm -hmm. sign regulation, so to speak, and, and to change it if, if whoever's right on the edge into mm -hmm. something different might mm -hmm. still be zoned one of them sure. three, but they're not mm -hmm. inclusive, sure. they have a legal argument. Sure, and I think working with staff, that is an easy line to draw where it makes sense regulatory-wise, so. Okay. Thank you. Perfect, so we'll pull this back through the first meeting of October for a discussion about the, the nuance and the details after we can put everything together. Does that work? All right, anything else? All right, thank you very much for all your work on it. We'll get there eventually. We'll get there, <laughs> I promise. All right, thank you for being here. We're gonna move on to the next item. Uh, 7B, citywide survey discussion, Mr. McNeil. Thank you, Mayor and Council. One of the things that we discussed with you earlier this year was the uh, desire to do a, what you would term a scientific telephone survey for preferences and attitudes uh, throughout the city. Wanted to talk with you further tonight about what that would entail and uh, gauge your level of interest. A number of our neighboring <coughs> communities have made it a practice either annually or every other year, in some cases every four years, to do a survey of the community to see how people perceive the levels of interest uh, for the services, the various programs that are conducted by the city. Uh, they also use it as an opportunity to determine what the needs, wants, and desires are. I think as we're interested in performance measurement, one of the things we have to identify is where are we right now? That we need to identify a baseline from which if we put resources into different programs or services or things such as that, that we can see whether we're improving or decreasing and where uh, those might be. Um, I contacted the company with, that many of our uh, neighbors have utilized to determine what that would include for Shakopee should we do that. Uh, the company that is probably best known in the Twin Cities area is Morris Leatherman. It used to be um, Decision Resources, Inc. I spoke with Peter Leatherman about the process that we've used for a first-time uh, sort of user such as Shockley. First, he commended you for looking at this. He really uh, thinks that as elected officials, you need to know from the people uh, what the broad outlook is. You'll hear, as you know, uh, often from people who are passionate on either one side or the other of a particular uh, topic. He says 50 to 60 percent of the people are in the middle somewhere and that's where it's important to really find out where they are so that you can make good public policy. It's going to impact the majority of your constituents. Um, I asked him for the people or for the uh, clients that they have uh, on a regular basis those are there, as you can see, it ranges anywhere from the size of Chaska to Minneapolis. They've also actually done work for the Shakopee School District and for the Farmington School District. Um, the sorts of, sorts of things that, you, that are questions can be grouped into a number of different, uh, excuse me, not numbered areas, but into some definite um, areas as you go through. Housing is uh, one of the ones that's very common on that. You look at it, the mix of housing, affordability of housing, what people's attitudes are towards that. Parks and Recreation, what programs are you providing? Are those meeting the needs? I think it's also very important right now as we're going through a facility study group to look at things that have been high on people's priority lists um, over the years, whether we need or whether, what the support is for a second sheet of ice. Uh, for an indoor swimming pool, improvements at the community center, uh, turf fields, any number of things like that. And most importantly on that, what's the level of support for additional funding for that or how that might be funded. Uh, transportation and transit, uh, they often ask about commute times, they ask about, they ask about bus service and look for ways to improve that. And finally, we could probably add one on roundabouts since we have that um, up and operating now in portions of the communities. Uh, economic development, commercial and retail services. I know that there's 
a lot of people that have desires for different retailers that come to the community. What actually is the level of support for those sorts of things? Jobs, where they work, what sorts of things they'd be looking for if, if uh, they could wave a magic wand and bring those uh, job creation, uh, the businesses to Shakopee. Property taxes are another big one. And what's your level of uh, comfort with the amount of taxes that you have? Do you think it should be lower? How much lower? Are you okay with increasing property taxes? Public safety is another one which is commonly looked at. Uh, patrol for police, uh, crime prevention efforts for them. Uh, fire, have you had use of the fire department? If so, you know, was that satisfactory to you? Flood preparation is something that we might take a look at as we've had some interest um, certainly this year in terms of where things have been and how we prevent uh, future occurrences like that and animal control issues. Continuing public works, uh, we often ask on snow plowing, street maintenance, recycling and garbage. I'm guessing that that would probably be of uh, interest to a lot of people now that we're into 90 days of the new hauler. Job performances of the mayor and council and city staff. Have you had opportunity to contact the city? And if so, did you get your, res your issue resolved uh, quickly, professionally, and courteously? And then finally, communications. How are we doing in terms of getting the word out to you? Social media, uh, the website, how often you visit that newsletter. If you look at it and you see that only a very small percentage are actually using the, the newsletters is something that really makes sense to continue doing. So hopefully with this you'd be able to make decisions that would best utilize the services, the resources that the city of Shakopee has. Um, overall, the uh, sample survey, uh, the pe people to whom they talk is uh, determined at random. About 35 to 45 percent of the calls that they make right now are to cell phones. So it's not just we, we take the phone directory out and, and uh, determine who we're going to call. Um, there's also a uh, need to do uh, multilingual sorts of questions. We have a large part of Shakopee that does not have English as a primary language. Um, as Morris Leatherman said, if we survey Minneapolis, we can certainly handle Shakopee. So those are things that are important in order to get a good cross section of the community. Costs, excuse me, uh, and the other f factor on this is really the uh, amount of time that people uh, would be asked to devote to it. Uh, typically it's 30 to 45 minutes. He said that once people understand they're not being sold something, they're actually uh, in many cases very interested in uh, talking and we have good participation rates once you get through to them. Costs are the thing that probably are uh, is something that we need to be uh, concerned with. That's going to depend on one, what your uh, desire is for accuracy, and then how many questions you ask. For a city of our size, about 400 telephone surveys would be needed for what they call a plus or minus 5% accuracy rate. You can increase that by going to 600 calls, but your accuracy rate will go to within 4%, about a 1% difference. I don't know for general purposes if that's something that the extra money would be well spent to do. And again, the other thing is the number of questions. There's a certain amount of questions that you can do before somebody's going to get overloaded on it. But the questions themselves range from about 80 to 150. Figure 10 to 12 of those are just going to be general demographic things, female, male, income level, household ownership, that sort of thing, which helps to identify uh, who your respondent's going to be. If it is something that you would like to do, uh, it takes about three months from the time that you say go to when you would get the final response uh, back from them. I'd like to think that we could get that started if you choose to do that yet this month. So that means we would have the results back by about the 1st of January. That way we'd establish that baseline that I spoke of earlier so that you can move forward from that on it. Um, as far as the process on it, the important thing is the actual document itself. I gave you some sample questions that they use. We'd want to meet with representatives of you as the elected body, uh, city staff, and other key stakeholders in the community, the school district, the chamber, those sorts of things. As long as it's focused on city sorts of questions that we can use then to best identify 
what we've got as far as issues to address here in Shakopee. So with that, that's the background on the survey. Is it something that you'd be interested in doing? Questions or comments? Questions? Comments? Councilor Whiting. What is the response? I mean, you said it up to a half an hour it could take to do a survey like this. Yep. How often are you going to get some of the, and maybe, maybe you don't know the answer to this, but I just don't see young people taking the time to spend a half hour. Someone that's more invested in the community, I think they would because it has to do with city stuff. But do, do they give you an idea of what the spectrum of response is? I got the impression that uh, it really didn't matter what age it was. I mean, people are interested in, if somebody's listening to them on their opinions, they'll share that. Um, if somebody just doesn't have the desire to sit on the phone for 30 minutes, they tell them up front, well, thank you very much, and they move on to the next one. Until they get that block of three, 400, uh, uh, 400 yeah. people into their queue. And again, and, and, and they want to keep it balanced so that you don't get all, you know, retirees or you don't get all, you know, people under 25. What you're looking for is a cross-section of the community right. that's proportionate to what your uh, census data shows. Um, Mr. McNeil, are you going to do some of these where a link to our, on our website so that they could take it that way? Or does it have to be through a phone call? In order for it to be scientific, it needs to be by telephone. We, I've talked with my counterparts about that. You know, they've done surveys that are online and they've done those with Morris Leatherman. The one that I talked to said it was actually not that far off. Um, I've also talked to others that you get uh, the online that are folks that <laughs> have a particular passion or interest in it mm -hmm. and it may not be representative of the entire community. Okay. I think after we've established a few of these and we have a general idea as to where Shakopee is, it might be something that you could expand. I do recall one of the community center questions that was put in the late 1990s and I think what we got and what the actual vote was were two different things. You don't have a problem with this? I, uh, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to, to voice what some of the questions are. <clears throat> um, I think 400 is not a good sample of how many households we got in shock. I mean, obviously you become a statistician all, in the last 15 minutes? Well, <laughs> 400 of 12,000 12, households or whatever is like, that's a really small percentage. But I realize you can't do them all. So I would try to get more the key is how those are sampled. I mean, if they just go, you know, down the phone directory and they take the first 400 that start with A, you may or may not get a good cross-representation of where the city is. If you go every tenth name statistically, that's probably going to give you a better random factor than other ways of doing it. I can't tell you specifically. That's why these people are professionals and they do it. And generally speaking, at least the results that I've seen have been pretty accurate. Councilor Luce? Personally, I think there's, you know, the question's a time, it's, it's just, I don't think there's many people that are gonna sit there for 30, 45 minutes answering questions. I, ju I wouldn't, there's no way. And as far as cell phone numbers, I don't know, you know, I only have a cell phone, I don't have a landline, so they're not gonna be able to get a hold of me unless somebody's starting to publish cell phones. Yeah, they will. He, yeah, he they said will. it's scary how much information they can find out about somebody that's mm -hmm. just necessarily in the phone directory. Um, I would like to see it either done in a city newsletter or put it online for a test case. You know, just, just to try it out, just to get a feel of what we're getting for answers before we start doing a phone survey, which, you know, that's spending a lot of money right up front. Uh, get a basic idea before we go headlong into this. Councilor Lehman? Didn't we do, I think we did ours, our last one in 99 uh, with the community center, Gretchen Tice and I were co-chairs on that, um, through the Scott County, where they had a code, they actually got a code, and you had to go to their website, type in a code or something, and fill out the survey, and once you did that, you couldn't go back in because you already utilized that code. Hmm. I think that's how it was done. Yeah. 
there, memory isn't totally si right. Since I've lived here, there was one that got sent out. Uh, so I moved here in 03, and I think it was 03 or 04 for that referendum that was a thing that got mailed out. Um, and that was the referendum that Mark Demig was the big one right. for everything. And that got sent out that time. Yeah. Um, but I, I would very much like to move forward with this. I, I don't. I think it's very good information that we need to have that's been sorely missing for the last while on the entire community as a whole as to where we're at. And I, I agree with you completely, Mike, that uh, if we could do it on and get good, accurate information on a website or something like that, that would be a much cheaper and easier way to go. But we're just going to have Jay Whiting going up there and hitting 14 <laughs> times that we're the only thing we care about is history. And <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and I, 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 as much as I love history and I love Jay Whiting, that's not what I want to know. I want to know what uh, is really going on. And I think that having someone independent and scientifically do this is important. Just a thought, um, is there an opportunity to partner with the school district or anything, or does that totally taint the, the field here? Uh, we could certainly ask them. I know they are going through in that very extensive exercise right now on trying to determine uh, school district issues and I have a feeling those are probably that's probably a separate set of issues yeah. than what we're trying to get out of this could we shorten up the length of it by minimizing the questions and then broaden the pool we can certainly do that um, again there are going to be a base number of questions that they're going to have to ask for demographic purposes but uh, I know some cities they just concentrate this year we're going to ask about public works and next time they do it they do it on public safety so if you want to reduce the number of questions that you have by the number of topics that you want to cover that's easy to do just you're going to have a base cost to get it out anyway and assuming that you don't so overload people with just minutia type questions um, your cost per response is probably going to be less by adding at least a manageable size of questions to get it done front once. So where I, what I'm getting at is instead of losing the person at 45 minutes, if, if you could stick to 30 minutes or less mm -hmm. in your outline that this company uses, then you're not, you know, you're trying to keep it as short as possible so you don't lose the, the folks, the potential people taking a survey. Yeah. I like right. the idea of trying to partner with the school district, though. You know, if they can throw in 20 or 30 questions, we get 20 or 30 questions. A lot of them are going to be beneficial to both of us, even if Absolutely. the other one asks it. Mm -hmm. So I think we could both make a, you know, some very good use of this. So let's ask that question and bring it back on the 16th. Um, as it's presented, or is there major changes that the majority of us would like to see? Speak now. Well, I'd like to see it as short as possible so we don't lose people and, and Broaden, broaden it to 600. Yeah, and I think we have to shorten it if we're gonna if they're gonna go in with it. They're gonna have specific questions they want. Right. I wouldn't argue with that. Well, I would say we let the experts that are the mm -hmm. the stat folks say that if they can get a 45 minute survey out of 400 people, that's gonna be meaningful and have a mm -hmm. that we listen to what they say because I don't know anything about taking surveys and statistics. I'm not sure how we can tell them that that's mm -hmm. not their job. Yeah, we're paying well, them for the number. It's my understanding that we have input on what kind of questions they're asking. Right. So we're already d dictating how long the survey is going to be based on what questions we want to ask. Yeah. They'll figure out the technical right. wording of that if question. I, if we I could, it. I think we could probably, let's identify what it is that we want to talk about. Um, there may be some things that aren't a large issue and if that's the case then we just don't ask those we do it in a future year things like that if the intent is that you want to keep it as brief as possible but still be meaningful let me do some additional checking on that and find out what's what are people's boredom factor at what point did this start turning off because it's too long um, and I can bring that back to you mm -hmm. perfect okay Moving on to uh, 7C1, preliminary 2015 budget and property tax levies. Do we need to take a break or anything before we get started with this? Yeah, no, we're going to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> seven minute recess. Uh, seven minute recess. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second. And do we have any discussions? Too much Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed? Aye. Pass unanimously. We're in uh, recess for seven minutes.
you just holler. All right, right. Polo City Council meeting back to order, and we're talking about uh, preliminary 2015 budget and property tax levies. Ms. Linehan. Good evening, Mayor and Council and City staff. Before you this evening is the next step in the city budget process. As you're aware, under state law, the city must pass a preliminary levy, and that is this year by September 30th. The final levy will be presented to you in December 2014. The preliminary levy is what we are discussing yet tonight because there were several issues that were unresolved as of the last council meeting that we had uh, been requested to bring information back to you. Plus to give you a uh, discussion point of where do you really wanna go on this year's levy? We've talked a lot about the, the different requests that have been made. All in all, city budgets operationally are right in line with previous years. There's been some changes that were outlined in the rather extensive memo you received in your packet. Uh, some of the issues that have changed between 2014 and 15 are things like the uh, situation with the uh, public safety. You'll notice some decreases there because there were changes in the joint prosecution agreement. There's also some items that internally we've taken some time to really look into, such as equipment costs and the allocation of the charges for those. We have ahead of us the task of determining where does the council wish to go with the levy. What I've provided to you in your uh, packet was a bit of a detailed format from the county that explains if you were to take last year's base levy and if you were to look at different options for what would happen if you were to increase the levy, let's start on this side, keep it flat, go 5% increase, go 8% increase, go 10% increase, what you see here would be your tax rate and your adjustments to the uh, overall impact. As you recall at the last meeting, we also discussed a 13% growth rate in the values that is presented by Scott County. One of the issues ahead of you tonight is the maximum levy that will be presented to the council on the 16th. Now, what you will see in your packet that you will be asked to, uh, to approve at the next meeting would be this type of a resolution. And what this does is it sets the maximum levy, plus also it addresses the debt service levies. As you notice, I've left this blank. And the debt service levies are the three that we discussed at the previous meeting for the fire department building, the debt service that we put in place last year, and the addition of one more debt service. What we're asking council tonight after the discussions that you'll hear is where do you wish to go with this levy increase for your maximum levy? Again, reminding you, your maximum levy cannot be increased after the meeting of the 16th. It can only be decreased. At this point, I would like to have Chris, who has provided a follow-up on the IT issue that was discussed last time, and also Chief uh, Coleman to discuss the personnel-related costs. Are there any other questions at this point? Because the one piece ahead of you tonight is just to provide staff with the direction of where would you like this resolution to be filled in for the next meeting, giving the staff the direction of what will be submitted to Scott County for the preliminary levy. Again, remembering, can be lowered, cannot be increased. And your recommendation on that? Is My recommendation is a 10% increase, and that is based on, that will give you the potential to address a lot of the issues you as a council have proceeded to bring forward over many months dealing with downtown issues, dealing with Highway 101 issues, putting forward community initiatives, working with the different EDA type projects that you've been faced with, dealing with the personnel requests so that we can take on the tasks as a council that you've prioritized for the community. We will continue to work through the budget, October, September, October, November, right up to that December. Refining numbers, um, this isn't like the old days when I would do budgets and you'd have August 30th, you'd have your numbers firm. Those things don't, don't happen right now. The state of Minnesota and other entities we work with don't always have this information to communities really early. We keep refining things, we keep adjusting things, and we keep bringing them back. 
Uh, so at this point, my request to the council is consider the 10 percent. One of the factors that I think you'll see very clearly is even with a 10 percent levy increase, and I know that makes headlines, your tax rate. Your tax rate will absorb it. Now, I'm not going to give you the impression that no one sees tax increases because you are all aware of the fact that across the board, especially on the data that we had sent out to you on the what if sheets. Could you show those for us? I certainly will. That if you take the information that the county has provided, and let me see if I love this sheet because I can just make everybody really squint. These are also my favorite sheets. Yes, I know they are. And th these are really, again, thank you to the county for preparing these because I think these are really good documents. What it will do is it will provide, and it's down here in this residential impact area. One of the most telling things when you're reviewing your budgets this year is literally 90 some percent of your properties are going to see property value increases. It's just the flow that you're seeing right now in residential growth. So what will happen in a situation like this, and I can't speak across the board because every situation in every household is very unique, you will typically see increases in taxes even if you hold a levy flat because market values increase, so of course your calculations are gonna reflect a tax increase. What you will see because of the base from if you go back up here and you take a look at your net tax capacity because you have growth in your net tax capacity you have the ability to tackle needed or deferred projects because you have growth those are very difficult things to do in times of property value declines this is a, a time where I think a lot of people look at budgets and say, yes, we, we want to hold the line or no, we really need to take on some projects for the growth in the best of the community. And that's the direction we'll be asking council tonight. Do you have any questions at this point? Yes. Um, Julie, how yes. Okay, so if we set the levy at 10%, you're right. saying that we can lower it how many times and how often? You can lower the levy right up till that final meeting in December. What we will do is I have, uh, what I typically like to do just to give council flexibility is you have the two meetings in December. The first one, we will bring the final levy and the final budget to you. If approved, that's what we move forward with. If there's still questions, but we will also be bringing updates to you on the budget through the upcoming months. So if you have questions or concerns or if there's projects that you've thought about, you need to readjust, you need to plan differently, that's something we can address. Okay. okay. Any other questions? And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Wilson. I'll leave my pile of papers here. Just try not to disturb them. Oh, trust me, they're disturbed already. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Mayor and council members, I thought I would start just in answering um, a question that was asked of me two weeks ago tonight when I stood up here, and that was for a look at our staffing levels over the years. Um, so as you can see from this chart, in the 2014 budgeted, we are authorized at 141. Um, regular employees. The vast, vast majority of those are full-time employees. Um, I believe three of them work something less than 40 hours a week. So we're at 141 um, in this year's budget. And um, you can see that heading into the economic downturn, we were at 139 and dipped as low as 127 um, in the 2012 budget. So we have seen increases in our staffing levels in the last two years. Um, and they have put us just slightly over our previous peak of 139. Any questions on that one? Okay. 
Um, my primary purpose standing up here tonight is to talk to you about, once again, about IT services, a topic that we covered um, in our budget discussion two weeks ago, um, but that we are continuing to try to find the best solution to. The city currently has a two-person IT staff. Um, and it basically looks like one person trying to do this and somebody else trying to do this. Um, this position is vacant right now and um, just due to normal staff turnover and we're having a challenging time trying to find a jack of all trades to fill that position. So um, we would like to throw out to you the concept of creating a standalone IT department. Currently, our two-person IT staff is part of our ad administration department, and those individuals both report to me, and I provide some of the budgeting and policy and supervision that you see under the IT director heading here, but without the subject matter expertise. I did not go to college in the IT field and um, have relied on our subject matter experts for much of, to teach me over the years much of what I do know about the IT field and our IT services and needs here at the city of Shakopee. So um, the suggested outline, like I said, is a five um, member standalone department with a director that reports directly to the city administrator. Um, it has two equal positions titled IT specialist um, with a temporary or a tentative uh, division of labor being one focusing on police and fire by far our two largest departments and greatest need departments in the IT area. The other one providing the same set of services to the remaining city departments. The benefits of that is you have cross training of skills and while they might specialize in one department or the other, they certainly would have the technical skills and ability to back one another up in case of a absence or uh, medical leave or something like that. Um, you've got an IT coordinator with something that the private sector would call a network and server admin in the center um, doing all of our behind the scenes work. A director leading the group who's responsible for planning and innovation, budgeting, policy, supervision, collaboration with other partners and major projects. And then an IT assistant um, handling a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks that pull away from our skilled and uh, talented staff and have them doing things that um, could be done by someone at the assistant level. So uh, the proposal is as most not without its costs. Um, implementing the proposed IT department um, would bring a cost of $253,000 to the 2015 budget. Um, the finance director and I have discussed that as well as available sources of funding for this project and it's our initial recommendation that the council consider um, collecting 50% of that amount through the tax levy and you, the remaining 50% could come out of our IT fund which traditionally is not used to pay for personnel costs but is in a healthy position right now and could be used that way as a bridge uh, to a new department. Um, it's not sustainable to continue to use that IT fund to pay wages on the long term. Um, it could easily be done in 2015 and you could probably pay for a portion in 2016 as well without creating um, any great inability to cover our other needs out of that fund. Questions? Concerns? What's the rest of the sentence say? This will not be sustainable indefinitely, but will allow for the cost of a full IT department to be gradually added to the tax levy over two or three years. Okay. Anybody? Mr. Lehman? Well, I just think going from two to five is uh, a pretty bold move. I think it's too much all at once. Okay. Anyone else? agree with him it's that's way too many at one time why cost um, you grow too fast people don't know what they're doing um, take it in one at a time and each person knows where they're supposed to be 
would you be good with adding two positions instead of three? I'd be happy with one. Okay. But we can't even fill one right now. A big part of the problem is that where we're our IT coordinator position that we've got up there is it's very, very much under 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 valuing what that position does. So in order to get someone in there, we need to elevate that position mm -hmm. in order to get anybody. Um, but we still need that core position of right. doing the exactly. server work and our security disaster right. recovery. So it's finding that person that wants to spend hours and hours in a server room setting those things up and then turn around and lead a group, interact with policymakers at other lo levels, uh, organize and coordinate projects and vendors and budgets. Um, we've been looking for a jack of all trades and that significantly alters our available pool of candidates. Council Whiting? If we pared this down to four, which one would you drop, the assistant or the, the specialist? One of the specialists. I would look at the choice as being a dropping the assistant or the director, quite honestly. Not um, the, the second specialist was my initial budget request for this year, was an mm -hmm. additional person at that level, and I still believe that that's our number one priority for getting through the day in the IT division. The IT specialist that we have is excellent. She's smart, she's dedicated, she works hard, um, but there's just only so much one person can get to in a day. Um, so my number one priority is, is obviously filling the vacant position we have with somebody that will manage our servers um, switches. And then after that, as far as growth, my number one priority would be that second IT specialist. Um, if you ask me to recommend four, it would be between the IT assistant and the IT director. And I'd probably want to have some conversations with my colleagues on the department head team to make that decision as a group because this impacts them just as much as it impacts me. Council mm -hmm. Mogul? Chris, can you tell me how many people the IT department supports? How many staff members besides <laughs> citizens? 41. There you go. 141. 141 staff people plus a pool that has part-time staff plus, um, you know, the paid on-call firefighters in the sense of the MDTs that we have in the in the trucks. Um, we have about 155 network accounts. That's what I was um, which would be a way to compare sort of apples to apples across organizations from an IT perspective. We've got about 155 networks. Do you know accounts. how many computers versus laptops versus all of those things that we support as well? Not off the top of my head. I Ballpark, I would say we've got over 100 desktop machines, and then we have MDTs, mobile data, data terminals, basically heavy-duty laptops in all uh, police and fire vehicles and we're growing into tablet use in the public works and the engineering department specifically, but other departments um, as so well. So my point would be that the more you start adding to this, the more that this looks realistic to me. Well, I, just, I just see the technology changing and, and um, more coming online you know, for the needs that we have. And, and if you start thinking about the police and the fire and all of the, the data they're collecting and the different uh, gadgets and technology that's involved there. I understand we need to, we need some people there to, to manage all that, especially at the rate it's changing. So, um, and I'm not sure which, which position, you know, I'm not in a position to know mm -hmm. where I'd cut here, but I, I could see the value in, in uh, ramping up, but maybe not going the full, full five. Would you look at making your coordinator, seasoning them into the director and then just hiring a coordinator later on? That is an option if I thought I that understand you don't have a candidate to even yeah. think about that, but. Uh, that was what we went into the hiring process hoping to find. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that's becoming readily apparent with each day and each meeting we have about something that needs to get done 
is I don't have a lot of time for that IT mm -hmm. coordinator to be seasoned into the director role. Right. Um, if I thought needing a director was three years off, then I, you know, I, I love the idea of promoting from in and, and promoting, you know, a existing employee and a known quantity and so on. I'm not sure we can wait that long um, to find somebody to fill this IT director role. So, does Layman? I want to definitely fill the uh, specialist position. It's open, but doesn't um, our disaster recovery and well, fiber search got calling you. Is it the disaster recovery? Don't we hire somebody for that already? No, we um, we back up from a site in one city building to a fully operational site in another building should we need to bring it up. And then we're working on what's called a tertiary backup, a third level of, of backup. And that's got to be. Because again, you think about how inherent technology is to every single thing that we do. If we are dealing with some kind of disaster situation here and we can't give police, fire, public works, building inspections the tools they need to do their job, you're going to hear a significant outcry from, from the public on that you know, inability. Remember, technology is going to make it all simpler, <laughs> easier, <laughs> less paper. Hopefully it makes it easier remember? for the customer on, on their end. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily easier to operate from an internal perspective. Well, I firmly believe that for every dollar we put in to technology and investing in new technology, we're easily going to get five to ten dollars back on that through efficiency and through uh, being able to implement new software and being able to uh, have new services available to residents that residents want. I mean, because if we move forward in the future with um, uh, example of if we did permits online, which the vast majority of other communities do that we don't currently do, that takes IT staff and that takes people to handle it to provide those services that people want and uh, we're way behind the eight ball. And I mean, we had a, a data breach earlier this year, which wasn't a big deal, but I think that we've been extremely extremely lucky with as thin as we run our IT staff as ridiculously thin as I think we've redone run our IT staff um, and not having a full department to run and handle these things I, I think I'm very much in favor of of the five positions I don't think that would be with the size of our organization and who we are if you look at uh, businesses we talk a lot about running the city more as businesses do and uh, with more capitalistic intent on things there's not a an industry that you'd find anywhere or a business that you find anywhere as large as ours that doesn't have twice this size of an IT staff and um, it is it's putting us at a huge liability not having people in those positions Councilor Lehman two things I'm absolutely certain of one is your computer will be outdated in a very short period of time as with all technology, it keeps changing, okay? Second thing I'm absolutely sure of is not too many businesses more than double their IT staff in a snap of a finger. Well, I agree with you. But they also would have built it up over time as the need was, was well, and there. Maybe that's the strategy. But the need is there. I, I mean, we don't need to argue at that point. I'm. If, if everybody's more comfortable with four positions instead of five, I'm okay with that. I think that beefing this up will dramatically help the entire organization. And I very much appreciate, even if it doesn't get to the full five, staff bringing this forward this way. Council Layman. And the, the other point I would make about government compared to the private sector, if you put permits online, will you cut staff that currently does handwritten permits? Probably not private sector, they'd replace them. They'd replace them with an e-model and then positions would go away. I don't believe that to be true. It is true. Okay. We'll disagree on that. Mr. Mayor, if I could. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> well, I just apologize. I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you want us to take a seven minute recess? <laughs> no, I do not want you to take another seven minute recess. Um, 
I'm sorry. I'll just have to Ooh, let that go uh, until the next time. When it comes I back. Okay, is there anybody it's else been a long day. Who, would, who would like to see the full five positions that staff has presented? I would. Council Mokel. Anyone else? I could go with that. I think we just need to. I'm, I'm not sure where we can. I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to hire them all tomorrow anyway. No. I'm just saying no, it'll, it's, it's going to be kind of worked up to that. Yeah. It's not going to be that tomorrow because, I mean, I'm assuming that these won't all be hired until. They would August. not all be hired. I mean, they would not all be hired tomorrow. I definitely am hoping to get some kind of commitment because I need to go out and fill the position that we have. Mm -hmm. And whether I'm looking for the, the second person in a two-person IT department or the second person in a five-person IT department makes a di big difference on who I'm going to bring into that spot. The other thing is, you know, we've got on here the total annual cost because I prefer to always show you the full year cost. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ms. Linehan and I can go back and talk about an order of filling and scale some of those wages back so one is funded for eight months of the year and one is funded for six months of the year to reflect the realities of how we hire and, and bring people on board. Um, right. So if we're going with a director, we'll clearly want to do that early on so that they have you know, significant mm -hmm. say in the yeah. fleshing out the remainder of, of the department and the team. That's loose. Are the different departments billed back for the IT uh, work that's being done that's in their areas? Excellent question. And that's yes, and that's where our IT fund gets its money. The one thing we do not bill back, though, is time. We actually don't bill back is probably. We have a per network account charge. Um, and so in the police department budget, in the fire department budget, each budget you will see a line item that says internal IT charge. It's based on how many network accounts they have in that department. That generates in the neighborhood of $360,000 a year that's revenue into the IT fund, and we use that to buy computers and servers and tablets and switches and all, you know, all of the, the yeah, printers, all of the physical things as well as software and professional services. The one thing we don't pay for out of that IT fund currently is, are the wages and benefits of the employees doing the work. Council Lennon. Mr. Lewis, even if you did charge it back from each department, that means that department would increase its budget by that, that set amount, which means that the out. taxpayers would still pay for it anyway. Council Whiting. Can you tell me where that IT budget sits? You got that number flashed? Yeah. As you recall, when we were discussing in March where we were at at year-end 2013, we took a sizable transfer into the IT fund because, as both Mr. McNeil and Ms. Wilson will acknowledge, I have had a real concern over the IT situation in this city, both staffing and ability to maintain the quality and level of your equipment. 300000 was transferred in. We have a balance right now of just slightly over 500000 and we have sat, and uh, Ms. Wilson and I have talked at length, what equipment, when to replace, what's the charges, and we both agree we could plan for these positions with the dollars we've got without putting those funds at risk. Well, my concern is that those funds are there for a reason. They are set aside as an internal service fund to fund this critical need of the city. So takings from from that fund I, mm -hmm. I know you you feel you can do that but mm -hmm. then we're going to need to dump another 300,000 in there next year to, if we have a I, I think again we are looking at a, a system that well it's fairly new that fund has not been in place that long we are Five years. yeah we're developing and, and okay. as we grow but we really do feel that this fund could absorb this year and part of next year and still maintain its health all right so we've got Five, uh, three out of five council members for the preliminary budget for a five-member IT staff. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Councilor yeah. Luce, that's correct. That's uh, correct. I know you yep. got three. Yep. That's yep. what I'm saying. I'm just no, I'm giving sorry. you the opportunity to say. Okay. All right. So uh, item C three, position request, assistant fire chief. Um. Mr. Mayor and council members, we discussed this one as well at your last meeting, and there were several questions about it, um, and I have to admit I was 
one of our problems, I think, in communication was that I had enclosed a very early draft of the position request in your packet last time, not the uh, fully developed request that Chief Coleman had submitted. So that was in your packet, and hopefully you had a chance to take a look at it at that. With that more flushed out piece of information and the chief in attendance, we wanted to see um, what if any remaining questions there were about this position request for a full-time assistant fire chief to replace um, one of our paid on call assistant chiefs. Questions? Council Layman. Still say it's a position for scale. I know they, they say we have specialized training, but I think every department has specialized training, and I think the more that they're all cross-trained to work with each other, the better mutual aid response is. Mr. McNeil. And uh, I think to reiterate what we talked about last meeting, there, uh, through SCALE, the joint training facility, there are, is uh, some base level uh, training on that, but each department beyond that is unique and also needs to do training on an ongoing basis. From where Shockby is right now, we think that it's best suited by having an in-house person do that. I don't know that scales at a position now, you know, maybe someday in the future that they can do that, but they just aren't set now in the foreseeable future to do the sort of specialized training at the advanced level that we really require here. Do you, happen, do you happen to know who does the advanced training for Prior Lake? Middlewaukee, Sioux, Jordan? They use a similar, I don't, I can't speak for the Metawakanton Sioux, but Prior Lake and those other communities use a similar model as we do and get by as, as best they can. So it would seem to me that everybody involved would benefit if they would could collaborate together. Well, I would be willing, that's not this position, but uh, I would be very willing. I've talked about it before, but we haven't gotten any traction on it at all of uh, looking at fire districts as opposed to having just a simple not a simple but a shock be fire department but having they would have to have its own taxing authority and those kinds of things to become its own entity um, but looking at a, a larger combined department into the future and not just for fire I, I think it makes sense for police and detectives and other things like that because public safety is a gigantic part of our budget and I think it could be um, better served on a larger scale than what we can provide simply as our community. So I agree with you entirely that it, it should be a scale thing to do, but where, I don't know how we make that happen or where we do that, Jay? Seems like a good fit for scale eventually. I think, you know, it would take some bringing along. I mean, we've got a significant investment in the regional training facility already. Uh, whether or not that could cross into each specialty that each city has uh, whether or not scale is willing to look at that but I I think that's one of those opportunities that we should try and pursue first. Mr. Mayor if I could I think mm -hmm. one of the things of focusing or putting our eggs all in the basket of scale risks is I mean the emphasis of this position is on carrying out our, our training needs and planning for those and, and so on um, it also provides us with um, an additional person to provide supervision and oversight to the department when the chief is otherwise, you know, engaged in doing other things. Um, it's not only about training. And so if, if you go with the joint model, all you're going to get is a kind of a classroom teacher out of we that. We have officers, versus. lieutenants, and captains that are already part of the department that should be passing some of that knowledge on and doing that training as part of team building, too, I think, too. So. You have, you ha we're paying uh, service rates for those guys too, so there's some uh, room to grow there. I think it's that's lame. Do we, uh, we have four daytime responders, is that correct? We have a, yes. Four full time. So if we have a training person there during the day, would we cut that back to three? That is not the proposal. And then no. have the trainer be a responder also? That is not the proposal. There is a workload to be done here that if this person is going to every single call, won't get done. Um, this person would be trained to a firefighter and licensed as a firefighter and perfectly capable of sharing call response with Chief Coleman and with the fire marshal. Um, but to achieve the desired outcome, 
we need someone that's not interrupted by every sounding of the of the pager and then my last question how many people are available during the day to come in for training chief bear council member that that's going to vary from year to year um i would say right now we're probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 that we could train during the day well didn't we put a daytime crew on because we couldn't get daytime responses to come to the fire calls we couldn't get if we can get 10 we wouldn't have needed the daytime crew well what i'm saying is they're not available every day you know they may work a shift where they're working nights or they're working swing shifts so they're only available one day out of the week or two days out of the week they're not there every day right other questions thoughts that's a loose <clears throat> i'm open to consideration of it but i want to get a little better feel for how our four full-timers are are doing i know there's a questionnaire that's gone out i would like to see some of the um answers and how they compile before i would make this decision I've had a number of firefighters and I've talked to the chief about it that have claimed to have problems I'm, and I'm going to say claim because you know it's all in how you take what they're saying if they're em embellishing or just have a bone to pick. Um, I would say eventually we have to go to this. Um, I think we need to look it over a little more. This, this is the next step as we move forward in uh, in the fire service. I mean, uh, for 128 years, 129 years, the fire department's been here in town. Um, we went to a full-time chief, a couple full-time firefighters, a, a fire marshal. We really haven't made a lot of ground in 100 and some years in the fire service. Now, is that is that the fire service's problem, fault? I, I believe somewhat, because we keep saying we can do it, we can do it, we can do it. Um, the fire service isn't like it was 15 years ago. Things have changed, times have changed, lifestyles have changed. We have guys that are working 40 hours a week, coming to training, they have children, they have sports to take care of. They, the time commitment is not just not there. These guys love to do the job they do and they do it very well. They just don't have the time anymore. Um, we need to start looking at, into the future of how we're gonna provide this protection for our citizens. You kind of got to think of it as an insurance policy. That's what we're providing to our citizens as a fire department, is an insurance policy. What kind of level of policy do you want to give them? What kind of response time do you want to give them? Um, I can tell you right now our daytime crew is running about five minute response times. Our nighttime guys are down to about eight minutes now that we've, we've taken that daytime response out of there when we were at 13 minutes a year ago. So we have made some big improvements to protect our citizens. Can you give us that data sometime? I Just sure can. Every activity report. Thank you. I, I can have it to you tomorrow. I think this position would also be an insurance policy for our firefighters. We'd be better trained. Um, and I understand through talking to you um, that there's a lot of paperwork that goes on with this uh, firefighting nowadays, the reporting to the state and the insurance companies and everything else. Um, I am in favor of it. I would like to see the questionnaires and see if some of the bugs uh, can be worked out before we go too much further. Mr. McNeil? So, Mr. Mayor, if there's general support for this, one of the things you can do, as Ms. Linehan indicated, you've got until the end of the year really to make the final decision, right? You can put it in your preliminary budget, and then if based on the questionnaire results or whatever other information you might need before then, um, you can either choose to keep it in or to delete it <laughs> between the time that the final uh, levy is set and the budget adopted. I would be in favor of that. Other folks? I'm not, I'm sorry, Chief, I'm not a huge fan of moving this direction. Um, I, uh, we've talked a little bit about it in the past as, well, like I just said, as I, think there's a we haven't explored a different way of doing fire and public safety as in general and I don't know if that reaches as far as um, uh, 
code enforcement and, and those kinds of things. I don't know where where that begins or ends uh, for collaborating with other communities to do things or people want to collaborate with other communities to do things. But I'd much rather see us like having th this position shared, like Matt was talking about, between us and Savage and Prior Lake. Um, and I know we have different training and different ways that we do things and different equipment, but I don't I don't know and I don't know feel if that's the right way to do it or not. What do you think? Well, I, I think eventually we could get there. Um, somebody needs to be a leader in this in this county, and it's and I think it should be us. Um, if we start initiating and doing what we need to do to protect our citizens, I think it'll it'll eventually go out into the rest of Scott County, and we can maybe start molding the county into whatever that might happen to be. Um, what that is, I don't know. There's so much distance other than between Savage Prior Lake and Matt and ourselves that it's hard if you want to call it a county fire department or whatever you want to call it. There's too much distance between us right now to fill them needs and gaps. So in the future, yeah, it, might, it, may, it may become that. But I think we need to start taking the steps to get there and maybe we just, as the leader in the Scott County, make that step and keep going. We have the biggest tax base and a lot of our money is already leaving because of this. Mm -hmm. So if we had a countywide, I'll call it training chief or whatever you want to call it, I believe we'd end up paying 90% of it anyway because it'd be based off our population and what it is. No different than the training facility right now. We pay a lot of money to the training facility compared to every, everybody else. Mm -hmm. Do we get any more out of it? Not really. So if we were to do something like this, how would that lead us further in the direction of being a leader and, and getting more collaboration and things? Well, we get started in it. We already have the, we'll have the position, we'll have it filled, it'll be working, and maybe we can, once we get it going and it's going good for us, we can invite other county people to come train with us and, and say, hey, Jordan, we, we have a full-time training chief. Would you like to uh, buy into this now that he's here already? Okay. Type deal. Okay. Uh, just a question for the chief. Sean, uh, Savage has a second position right now. What is that? Uh, assistant chief. Assistant chief. He does similar? He, he does some training, yes. Okay. He does training and inspections and that kind of stuff. That is something that we can explore. I will say, in, in Mayor, you were at some of the service delivery meetings from SCALE. I mean, it's a great concept. It's a great idea. Politically, it's just at, with your counterparts in other cities, there's just not the support for it. And until that can change, mm -hmm. that it's a great idea, but I don't know how realistic it is, at least for the foreseeable future. Okay. We've got a need right now, and that's, that's why we brought the recommendation in to fill it. My, uh, you know, everything I've seen from the chief is that it will be filled regardless of how much collaboration there is. My guess is we would also, we would probably be providing it to other cities who might be interested in it. They might be able to help us with future funding. For the time being, though, we've got a need now for a full-time position. Okay, Matt? I'm surprised we didn't ask other cities ahead of time to see if they would be willing to uh, cost participate in this position. Do you know for a fact that we didn't? I don't see anybody uh, willing to participate. I assume if we asked them, they're not interested, or we didn't ask them. Okay. My, my assumption. I know, I know what the word assumption means. So, <laughs> Councilor Luce. I think we should uh, investigate that. You know, put some feelers out to some of the communities and see if, you know, like you say, the daytime training is a, you know, if there's guys that can't make the nighttime training because they work nights, they're at a huge disadvantage. You know, and you know maybe we train a little differently, but it. The basics are the basics. So I would think that, you know, if there's other cities in need of having daytime training, they should be um, open to, you know, a collective setup. I, I can tell you I've been doing this for a little over six years now, and we've been trying to get everybody on the same page as far as how we do accountability and how we do um, our on deck. And just them are terminologies, how we run our fire scenes. And we can't get the chiefs to agree how we do things. So to train to a certain standard is going to be tough until we get everybody to agree how we're going to operate. Are there ways around that? 
true. When I go to Jordan, I operate the way they want us to operate because that's just the way it is. You know, if they don't do accountability, I do it myself for our guys. And there's your first legislative issue. <laughs> well, I'll write that one down. I, I, I don't yeah, want to pick on any fire department. The fire department? Is that they, what you they do say? accountability down there. They just do it differently. Together to begin with, so you might as well. All right. Um, from what I'm hearing from everybody, is that majority wants to include this in the preliminary budget? Is that accurate? I think with more information. Yeah, with with further discussion on how we can do more collaboration and, and figure out how to share this type of position with other communities. I think that we need to take a look at that at least. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. That's good. It's in the preliminary budget. Okay. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> we'll get more information. All right. And ahead of you is the question that you will be seeing. Just to kind of walk through again. There's so many forms we get to fill out for the county and the state and everybody on this. This is just another one. This is one of the forms we submit to Scott County that provides them, and this would be a draft of where we would be with the levies that we've spoken about tonight. And my request to the council is for direction related to the levy as presented in your packet of how you would like to proceed on the meeting of the 16th with the preliminary levy, which will include, as was indicated, the general property <coughs> tax levy. It will include the debt service levies. And those also cover the issues that we've discussed at the previous meetings with the inclusions of the positions and also funding for the 101 slash downtown corridor. What would be the request of the council to proceed with a preliminary levy? All right, just so everyone's clear. Mm -hmm. um, what we're presenting there yep, we're is right back there. What we're talking about is your 10%, your 8%, your 5%, your flat. Exactly. So we're mm -hmm. recommending, we're going to make a motion. My on request a is to begin with a 10% levy on the preliminary. We will continue to work through that as we proceed through to the December final levy. And then as we get to the December final mm -hmm. levy, if council sees fit, Correct. they can pull that down or remove projects. Correct. As to get the final levy for the 2015. Mm -hmm. Councilor Lehman. Well, I'm a firm believer in the, the in order to enhance somebody's quality of life, you do that best by stop taking money out of their pocket. So I'm back in the 5% range. Was that a motion? Sure. Okay, could you restate it? I'll make a motion to bring forward a 5% levy increase. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Second by Councilor Luce. Any discussion? I'm very much in favor of staff recommendation, just so I'm clear as to where I'm going at the 10%, so I'm gonna vote no for this because it, uh, I don't think it gets on the projects that the residents want us to get done at this point. Any further discussion? Councilor Whiting. No, at the 10% level, that has all of the projects we've discussed, the positions we've discussed. Correct. We will be Pluses tapping into or? fund balance slash underspend because Seriously, I'm anticipating a significant amount again in the 2014 budget, just from a number of things that have been occurring in the first seven months of this year. A significant underspend. I believe there will be. Right now I'm tapping it in at 500,000 plus. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. 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 Councilors uh, Whiting. Mayor Tadke and mm -hmm. Councilor Mokel in dissent. Uh, the motion fails two to three. Do we have any other motions? Councilor Mokel? I'll make a motion to increase it to the 10% with being able to adjust it later. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Same by Councilor Whiting. Councilor Lehman. We could just do something totally off the wall and just go for zero for one year. We did that many years ago. That's oh, we have got zero. history with that. Yes. I don't know if this is the year to do that. <laughs> a zero levy. A zero levy. Yeah. All right. Further discussion? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Aye. Passes three to two with Councilors Layman and Luce in dissent. 
All right. Thank you, Council. I'll bring back the resolutions for Thank follow up. You. And we'll have that on the September 16th City Council meeting. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For all of your work. Uh, anything else? Other business at all tonight? Nothing. All right. Item 8. Need a motion to adjourn to September 16th, 2014 at 7 p.m. I'll make a motion to adjourn to September 16th, 2014 at 7 p.m. Councilor Mogul, do we have a second? Councilor Lehman. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passed unanimously. We are adjourned.